All right, so we're in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We left off at Philippians chapter 2 on the signs of an Epaphroditus as well as at Timothy. And you've learned a lot. That was a very special chapter for you guys, was chapter 2. So that way you can learn how you can become better in the ministry. So I hope that you've gained a blessing out of that, and it will be very helpful for you in the future. Now we're in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. So you'll notice the wording here. Paul, he finished talking at, or writing at Philippians 2.30 about Epaphroditus. But then Paul, he says, finally. Why would he say finally? Uh, he mentions, rejoice in the Lord, my brethren. So you are the brethren with Paul. He says to rejoice in the Lord. The reason why he says finally is because he repeated many times about rejoicing. So it's like, if you recall Philippians chapter 1 and chapter 2, he told them to rejoice and to rejoice. And then he says, finally, he says again, rejoice. <laughs> so Paul, he's repeating the command to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, which is found at another passage. So keep your hand at Philippians chapter 3 and go to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Verse 4, Philippians 4.4, 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, so constantly, and again I say. So see, he did say it before throughout Philippians. Rejoice. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, notice the wording here. The, la the last half of Philippians 3.1. To write the same things to you, so he wrote the same thing before to the Philippians about rejoicing. To me indeed is not grievous. Grievous. So Paul says to him, truly, indeed, it's not grievous to him. It doesn't bother him. He's going to keep writing the same thing, to rejoice. But for you, it is safe. For your sake, it is safe. It's safe that you know that. You might say, why is it safe for you to know that? Because the opposite of rejoicing is complaining, right? Look at Philippians 2.14. Philippians 2.14. Did you forget that one? He warned them not to complain. So that's why he's telling them to rejoice. Now, notice that he, uh, he wrote everywhere all the time about rejoicing. There is no doubt about that. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 1. Here's another example. Philippians 1. And then you'll notice that he mentioned to the Philippian church, the church at Philippi, to constantly rejoice. At verse 18, when Christ is preached, Paul says he's going to rejoice. Look at Philippians chapter 1 again, and then you'll notice he mentions about rejoicing at verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. So their rejoicing will get even higher. Look at Philippians chapter 2, and he mentioned about verse 16, holding the word of God. So he's going to hold on to his what? Joy. He's going to rejoice. In the Philippians 3, 1, we read that Philippians 4, 4. That's why he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So he's constantly saying that. And the reason why is the book of Philippians, as I mentioned to you before, it's all about suffering. Now, this is very important, is that even in times of suffering, in persecution, you can have joy. Can you believe that? So, even in times of suffering, you can find joy in the Lord. And this even means torture, persecution, which is pretty hard to believe, I know. But believe it or not, you can rejoice in the Lord. You can rejoice in the Lord. You can find joy. Now, I don't understand that, but if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, maybe you might understand a bit of that. You might understand a bit about these martyrs who rejoiced when they were about to be burnt at the stake and to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ. I cannot understand that right now. And perhaps the reason why I cannot understand that right now is because I'm so used to being comfortable in the flesh. I've never been so used to being uh, filled with the Spirit having my own flesh feeling the uncomfortable state. I never felt that before in my life. 
So maybe if I went through persecution a bit more, if I didn't uh, go through the feelings of comfort in my flesh, maybe I can understand a bit more about rejoicing no matter how bad the pain is. But the tendency of us today is that when we go through pain ourselves, uh, we easily complain, don't we? We easily whine. We easily get discouraged. And the reason why we easily get discouraged is because we're so used to being comfortable. We're so used to being comfortable. So it is important to understand that no matter how bad life is, and this is something important you have to remember, no matter how bad your suffering is in life, that you can rejoice in the Lord. Amen. So you can always find peace and joy. Now you might say, what are the reasons why I can find joy? Well, you didn't read Philippians, did you? There are many other reasons. There are many reasons why. The one reason is because of Philippians chapter 2, verse 14, that uh, if you don't rejoice, then you're going to easily complain. That's reason one. So the reason why you should rejoice... Let me write some of this stuff down. So then the reason why you should rejoice is because then you're going to have the opposite attitude of being negative. How many of you would like to live a negative life all your life? How many of you would like to complain all your life? If you complain constantly, you will become depressed and miserable. I would sometimes have to tell myself, tell other people that uh, when they're going through hard time in life that... Basically, you got to find something to rejoice in, not complain. You should not complain. If you complain, then you're going to believe in what you complain about. And then you got to realize that a lot of stuff you complain may be happening, may feel legit to you, but actually majority, you'd be surprised, is false. And those are just feelings of the flesh. you got to realize that 90% of what you worry or talk bad about don't even happen. So then you have to watch out for the complaining part. So you should rejoice. Why? So you can avoid complaining. And then number two, the reason why you should rejoice is because we found in several passages here. One we saw at Philippians chapter 1, and then we read verse 18. Verse 18, it's because the reason why we should rejoice during persecution is that the gospel is being spread. So then more people can hear about the gospel and get saved. A lot of people don't hear the gospel when they get comfortable. But then uh, when they hear about some Christian who uh, gets in prison for his faith, for having church, uh -huh, then what happens? Then the gospel is being proclaimed right there, their stance. Amen. But people, they just took church as something as whining or an option. But now people see that this is serious business. And maybe lost people will get more sympathetic toward Christianity. On that one. Another example is Philippians chapter 1, verse 26. Rejoicing becomes even more abundant in Jesus Christ when you're uh, with the brethren. Why? Because you're following alongside your brethren who are going through persecution and suffering. And they get to meet each other. Maybe you would take church uh, attendance more happily when you undergo persecution. Has that been going on for the past couple of years? You know, his fellowship got better and the people suddenly started to come to church more faithfully. Yeah, yeah. And then you took fellowship more seriously. You took people more seriously. I mean, each and every brother and sister in Christ. Why? Because that's what happens when you go through persecution is that uh, when you rejoice in the Lord, that uh, fellowship becomes even sweeter. If you look at verse 16 and verse 17, the reason why you can rejoice is because your labor is not in vain, your work. So then you get rewards for it. I mean, you don't really know if you're really working hard for Jesus until you're going under, undergoing persecution. Until you go through hard times and overcome it, right? But if everything's so nice and dandy, sometimes you wonder, am I just doing this because other people are doing it? Because my flesh is feeling that way. So that's the reason why you should rejoice during persecution. Persecution can be a good thing for some people who don't realize that. And not only that, uh, it's a command. That's the last thing. Uh, we saw Philippians chapter 4, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again, I say rejoice. It's a command. That's the reason why you should rejoice during persecution. And when you notice it's constantly, it's a command to do it frequently. If you don't rejoice frequently, you, uh, the feelings of the flesh will outrun your rejoicing. Did that make any sense? In other words, no, whatever your flesh feels when it goes through the environment... 
or however way the temptation put or whatever lust the devil puts in your flesh, then what happens is you're going to go by the emotions of your flesh rather than the joy of the Lord. All right, whether it be anger, depression, loneliness, misery, worry, fear, etc. But when you constantly rejoice all the time, then what happens? Just like you believe you're complaining, you're going to believe you're rejoicing here. When you keep saying, I thank God for my salvation, and God's going to reward me for this suffering, and then what happens is you're going to believe in it if you keep rejoicing constantly about it. So you have to keep doing that. That's why Paul says it's not grievous to me for me to write it again to you. It's safe. It's safe. Why you might say it's safe? Because that's the last thing is that uh, if you don't rejoice in the Lord, the last thing right here is basically then uh, it's not safe for you. Why? You could die. Having a bad spirit, a complaining spirit can cause you to die. Did you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 before? The Jews, they never rejoiced what God has given to them. They constantly complain and they died. So it's for your safety's sake. Besides, even if there is no God, a rejoicing attitude is still mentally and healthy safe for you. Amen. You have to understand that even without God, without Christianity, common sense is a rejoicing mentality and attitude is safe for you. I mean, if you don't believe me, then try being alone and depressed and miserable and complain. And let's see how healthy you are. All right, let's go back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 2 now. Verse 2. Beware of dogs. So Paul's saying that you have to watch out for the dogs, whoever they are. Beware of evil workers. Okay, the dogs are those who work evil. So you got to beware of them. Beware of the concision. Now that's plain. The concision, you have to beware. Now you might say, what is the concision right here? The concision right here is referring to the circumcision. Notice the next verse. You notice the next verse right there? It says circumcision right there. So then the circumcision right here is, ref is a sh another term for the concision, for some of you who didn't realize that. So then Paul's saying is that they are the evil workers that you have to watch out for. It's those Jews. And basically, uh, bottom line in the scriptures is this. Bottom line in the scriptures is that dogs is referring to, and evil workers is referring to those who teach wrong doctrine, who might think that they're doing it for the Lord, but actually, in reality, they're doing it for the devil, and they're not of God. Now, I'm going to give you some examples. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 7. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 7. For some people who don't realize is that Judaism, it is a religion of Satan. Oh, you're, you're messing with God's people? No, it's the truth. Their religion is the religion of the devil. And Satan wants them to be bound to Judaism so that they can burn in hell along with him when, he, when they die. So Judaism is not the right religion. Why? Because they're going by the works of the law. Now, we're going to notice right here, go to 2 Peter chapter 2. Notice who the dogs are referring to. It's referring to those teaching wrong doctrine. You'll notice at verse 22, But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, The dog is returned to his own vomit again. Who are the dogs? The dogs are referring to, notice at verse 1, verse 1 of 2 Peter 2, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. All right, look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Uh, can I have a paper towel, please, actually? The, the ink is spreading everywhere. I didn't realize that. It looks like the ink comes out here. So I was spilling everywhere. Can I have a paper towel? All right, we're going to look at the book of Matthew chapter 7. So you have to understand that the Pentecostal holiness churches, that they are uh, like Benny Hinn, T.D. Jakes, and then Joel Osteen who's a non-denominational preacher, Rick Warren, those guys are dogs. Amen. They are dogs, and they are filthy dogs. Well, that's offensive. They love Jesus. They talk about nice things, all the wonderful works of Jesus. You know what God calls those works? Workers of iniquity. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. They don't read their scriptures, do they? 
Matthew chapter 7. Look at verse 15. Beware of false prophets. That kind of matches with beware of evil workers, beware of the dogs, right? So, if you don't believe me, just keep reading. You'll notice the if Jesus says beware of false prophets at verse 15, notice verse 20 uh, verse 22, 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in that in thy name? See, Joel Osteen, and thy name have cast out devils, Benny Hen, and thy name done many wonderful works, Joyce Meyer. Look at verse 23, and then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from ye, ye that what? Work iniquity. So see, people didn't realize that. So they are evil workers. So evil workers are rightfully given to those who teach wrong doctrine. That is biblical. And notice that uh, they seem to be doing the right works for God too. You notice that right there? It looks like they're doing what's right. Well, why are they doing what's wrong? It's very simple. It's because they don't have the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's the key. The key is how you know you're not a false prophet is you have the knowledge of the Word of God, the knowledge of Christ. That's what it's referring to. Because go back to Philippians 3, the context. Why did Paul say, beware of these guys? Beware of these guys. Because he was talking about... A ten because he mentioned that... We, uh, we'll get there later on. But if you read from verses 4 all the way through 8, that's the false prophet system, which is Judaism, he was referring to right there. All those wrong doctrines. And he says that he... He gives up those things. And he trades them for something else. He trades them at verse 12 through 14. It's verses 12 uh, through 14. And then also verse, let's see right here. Mm. So yes, this is what it's referring to. So it's referring to verse uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. That's what he's trading it for. He's trading it for the knowledge of knowing more of Jesus Christ. It's for Jesus Christ's sake that he's trading it all for. He's not going to go by his own way. If you look at verse 8, verse 8, it says knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, right? So that's what he gives up. So let me uh, repeat again. So my argument is correct that basically the passage is telling you that if you don't have the Word of God in your hand, the Bible, the Word of God in your hand, which is basically knowledge, right? You ever heard these churches, oh, you know, you, you're too much full of knowledge but have no love? You notice that right there? Well, then that's that zeal that Paul warned about right there. See, Paul warned about that zeal where they think they're doing so much for Jesus, many wonderful works, but no knowledge is important. If you don't have knowledge, then what? Then you're going to do something wrong. Amen. So that's the reason why you have to have knowledge. And people who don't have knowledge and then claim that you're just being prideful and etc., then you know what? They really don't care about the knowledge of Christ. See, that's their problem right there. So that is their blatant problem and they don't care. They could care they could care a lick. They don't give a lick, sadly. Which is very sad. So doctrine is important. People don't make a big deal about doctrine. You should be scared. Can I repeat that again? You should be scared. So that's why it's important to know your Bible, to know doctrine. If you don't believe in that, then you should be scared because of Matthew chapter seven. It costs a soul. People don't realize that. It can cost a soul. So that's the reason why you should go by knowledge. You have to know knowledge. And we're going to cover that a little bit later on more. We're going to cover knowledge a bit more where it is important because you can have so much zeal, but it's not according to knowledge. And we're going to see that verse a little bit later on. All right, let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. For we are the circumcision. So Paul says, I, and he's referring to the Gentiles here. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. So he's speaking to Philippians, not Jews. He's saying, all of us, we're the circumcised, which worship God in the spirit. 
So it's based, the circumcision is based because of how you worship the Lord in the spirit. So it's done in the right spirit, not in the wrong spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus. That's why we rejoice in Christ Jesus. We give Jesus Christ the glory. We're happy and have no confidence in the flesh. Amen. So we don't put confidence, we don't put faith in our own flesh, in our own body. So the circumcision, go to Romans 2, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. The circumcision, it is based, you have to understand. Circumcision is based not on the flesh. It's based on the spirit. Now, I know that in the Bible that there is a fleshly circumcision and there are physical Jews. But when you're looking at today's day and age, where Paul is talking to Christian church age doctrine, God don't see the circumcision. He sees them as either a child of the devil or the child of God. And the circumcision, notice it's based spiritually, right? Worship God in spirit, right? It's spiritual. It's not physical. So you can boast yourself to be a Jew, but guess what? You're still going to burn in hell after you die if you are not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice Paul says rejoice in Christ Jesus. It's based in Christ Jesus, not in your ethnicity, your background, or in your flesh. Look at Romans chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says about who are the circumcision. At verse 28, verse 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. See, it's not the flesh. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. It's not outward that God's looking at. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. See, that matches Philippians 3. So circumcision is based spiritually. Uh, so John Hagee is wrong where he said that the Jews, that they don't have to become a saved Christian. They can be just the way they are and they'll go to heaven. No, that's heresy and that is blasphemy. And John Hagee just damned millions of souls to hell. How, millions of Jews hearing that, you know, then they think they can go to heaven after that. No, you have to receive, you have to go in Christ Jesus. That's genuine, real circumcision in the church age. Amen. All right, let's go back to... Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. So then Paul, notice what he thinks about uh, Judaism. He thinks that it's uh, just for nothing. We're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, and we'll read verse 4. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. So Paul's saying, uh, even though, verse 3, uh, I don't put confidence in the flesh, I might have some confidence in the flesh. You might say, why? Because he can brag a lot about what he is as a Jew outwardly in the flesh. Keep reading. If any other man thinketh that he hath, okay, if anybody else thinks that he's got, what? Whereof he might trust in the flesh, that he might have something that he has confidence, trust in the flesh, in his fleshly abilities, Paul says, I more. I got way more than that. So, the Apostle Paul here, he knows that he is way better than all the other Jews right here who can boast. The Jews here, they're considered to be uh, evil workers. They're considered to be dogs. Why? Because if you're not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a lost dog. It's that simple. Amen. It's not being racist. It's uh, any ethnicity out there. If you're not saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're rightfully called a dog. But more so if you teach wrong doctrine. More so if you teach wrong doctrine. So Paul, he can boast in comparison to this Jew way, way more, way, way more on his fleshly abilities. So let's look at his credentials, so to speak, right? That's what the world always looked at. It's fleshly credentials, not in the spirit what you are. Verse 5, circumcise the eighth day. So notice that Paul says that, look, I'm just not circumcised. It's not that I'm only circumcised. I got circumcised right at the exact day, the eighth day. If you know the book of Leviticus, God says circumcision should be done at the eighth day. If anyone is a respectable rabbi, I wonder if you ask them, ask them if they're circumcised. You'd be surprised a good number of them skip circumcision. They consider circumcision just a prick sometimes. 
I kid you not, just a prick. Believe it or not. So they're not really Jews now. They're not really practicing Jews. And if they say they are circumcised, then ask them, what day did you get it? You got it at the exact eighth day? So then I don't understand why these Jews reject Paul. Any chief rabbi out there, I wonder if we put their credentials next to the Apostle Paul and who's better. Paul's better. So if Paul's credentials are better, well, why don't I go by his writings more than the rab rabbinical writings? He's a better Jew than them. Say that to a Jew. They flip, man. They flip. That might be something good for you to use in the future. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. So he's from that stock. He's from Israel's stock. So he is genuinely a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin. Notice that he mentions a specific tribe from Benjamin. So notice that there's no such thing here that Jews cannot trace their tribes during that time. No. After the Babylonian captivity, Jews were able to keep tracing their lineage, their tribes. Paul mentioned that he was of the tribe of Benjamin. So then these people who have an anti-Semitic mentality, and then they might agree with you that, yeah, that's right, Jews are dogs, they're evil workers, part of the conspiracy elite, and they can't go to heaven, they're not genuine real Jews. Whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute right here. We recognize fleshly that there are Jews. Why? Because Paul admitted that at verse 4 and 5. He's not talking about spiritually of the tribe of Israel here. He's talking about physical fleshly. So he recognizes that. So there is a fleshly physical side of Jews, but what we're getting that is in the eyes of God, who is a spirit, he don't care about your physical ethnicity. ethnicity. In God's spiritual eyes, he's looking at your spirit. Is your spirit lost or is it saved? See, that's what God is looking at. That's why Paul says, I reject the physical side and accept the spiritual side. Amen. Now let's keep reading here. An Hebrew of the Hebrews. Well, that's pretty plain. Paul says he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Jew of Jews. So replacement theology that teaches that there's no such thing as a physical Jew is bunk. No, Paul recognizes that there is such a thing. As touching the law of Pharisee. So as concerning the law, touching the law, about the law, he says, I'm a Pharisee on that one. What does that mean? That means he's definitely well respected. For some of you who don't know, uh, the law, the ones who are considered the top, the cream of the crop concerning about the law of Moses, it was actually Pharisees, not scribes, definitely not Herodians, and we're not talking about regular Jews or rabbis, we're talking about Pharisees right here. Pharisees, even Jesus recognized that they were the top concerning about the law of Moses. Why would Paul boast about being a Pharisee then, right? rather than a Sadducee. Why would he boast being a Pharisee? Unless the Pharisees, they weren't considered to be the cream of the crop, the top. So let's look at some examples. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. Notice what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus recognized in comparison that if you want to be like as righteous as God, then the most righteous people he could pick out was Pharisee. And he says that you have to be above the righteousness of Pharisee to be as righteous as God. Trying to show how holy God is. So he used the Pharisees as an example. He didn't just use rabbis or Jews. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Notice what Jesus says at verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus does use the example of the righteousness of scribes right here in this case of the verse. But notice that Jesus, he realizes that Pharisee follows alongside that. That Pharisee is at there the top. If you look at the book of Luke, as we're not going to turn there for time's sake, he talks about a parable or a story that he compares a tax collector to a Pharisee. So why did he use a Pharisee out of all the other bunch right here? Because that's the ideal. If scribes, just like at Matthew 5, or Sadducees, or Sanhedrin, or other Jews, are going to be included in righteousness, you're going to notice a Pharisee is definitely the top that must be included. And then if there's only one person that they're going to pick concerning righteousness, they're going to pick a Pharisee. 
because that's the best. Otherwise, Paul would, would not have said that about touching the law. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 3 again. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Now look at verse 6, and that ties with what I talked about at verse 2. Conzer concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Now notice that Paul is putting his credentials here, that even in, which is kind of a shocker, but he mentions right here that, hey, you're talking about zeal. You want to talk about zeal? I'll t tell you zeal. It's not just walking around the image of the Virgin Mary on your bloody knees or praying five times like a good Muslim. I'm talking about I would even torture people without having a heart about it. He persecuted God's people, the church. That's how zealous he was. That's how passionate he was. That's how demon-possessed he was, pretty much. So notice right here that if you're going to talk about zeal, no one beats Paul concerning zeal. He was hardcore. He was die-hard about zeal. And that's the reason why Paul mentioned, as I've told you before, when we looked at Matthew chapter 7, it don't matter if you say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied, done many wonderful works? All of that is zeal. See that? abundance of the heart, you know, the sincerity of my heart. But if it's not according to knowledge, as I showed you, right, then it don't matter. You know, there are die-hard liberals out there, people who are Antifa and those guys, and even communists. I'm not about brainwashed communists in China and during the days of the Soviet Union. They believed with all their heart and they were passionate. But see, it's not according to the right knowledge. They don't have the right information. When you have knowledge, then the lies shatter, don't they? Lies shatter. You realize you're living in the matrix then, that this world is living in the matrix, that love is not really love as the left-wingers would like to put on their lawn. All right, look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. When you have knowledge, it ruins everything. It ruins all your zeal and all your hard work that you've done. Look at Romans chapter 10. That's why knowledge of the Word of God is so important. We stress knowledge so much. Why? Because we don't want to see you mess up. It's that simple. If we don't give you the right knowledge or any information at all on what is right and wrong, then you're going to be doing wrong stuff. It's that simple. It's that simple. I don't know why people don't get that. You know why? Because it ruins their zeal. That's why. It ruins their zeal. All right. Let's look at uh, Romans chapter 10. Notice what the Bible says at Romans chapter 10, verse 2. Verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Like Paul says, I have zeal, but not according to knowledge. See that? It's not to the right knowledge. Go back to Philippians chapter 3. And then verse 8 again. Verse 8 again. What did Paul say? I count it all but dung. I reject all of that zeal. Why? For the knowledge of Christ. Knowledge of Christ. See? All right, go back to Philippians chapter 3, and then we'll read verse 6 again. Verse 6. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, so concerning about being so holy and righteous based upon the law, the law, Paul says, blameless. I am blameless. I have no blame. So, some people... They might argue right here. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Now, obviously, Paul realizes that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, correct? Yeah, everyone, uh, everyone knows that, and Paul even recognized that. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So no one is blameless. No one is blameless. Everyone is a sinner. Everyone has blame, right? They have blemishes. But when we look at blameless right here, blameless is referring to practical living, how you live out your life in works. Now, we believe in dispensational salvation. For some of you who don't know dispensational salvation, what that means is that in different dispensations, there were what? In different dispensations, there were different salvations. For some of you who didn't know that. That's why you'll notice some verses in your Bible that will talk about works for salvation, 
But that's referring to a different time period. In the Old Testament, they were living by works for their salvation alongside with their faith. Now, some people might say that, no, you can't live your life with faith and works for your salvation. Because why? No one is blameless in their works. Everyone is a sinner. Those are people who deny dispensational salvations. Where they're pretty ignorant, notice that Paul claimed he's blameless in the works. And we're talking about Old Testament works right here. How about that? There is such a thing. But why did Paul reject that? Because in Paul's timeline now, he says it's based on righteousness of Christ. So Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's why he can gain his righteousness. That's why Paul had to change and reject his blameless according to the works. He was living under the Old Testament law. Old Testament salvation that time. That's what the Jews were doing. But they didn't have Jesus Christ dying on the cross yet that time. See, so then in the Old Testament they didn't have that. That's why Paul was doing just like all the Jews were doing. But when Jesus died on the cross, you had to change. And that's the reason why those Jews got mad at Paul. Why? Because they were living millennia under that. Or nearly a millennia under that. Okay, let's look at Luke chapter 1. Notice that there is such a thing before Jesus died on the cross that God would consider Old Testament salvation as blameless. Look at Luke chapter 1. Don't let these people who are pretty ignorant of dispensational salvation teach you that there's no such thing. Look at Luke chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. And they were both righteous before God. Isn't that what Paul said about his righteousness? Touching righteousness concerning the law, blameless. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, what? Blameless. Blameless. See that? There is such a thing. There is such a thing. All right, let's go back now. Verse 7. Verse 7. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. So there is such a thing that during the Old Testament time period that they had to do these, uh, that they had to live blameless in their works according to the law of Moses for their salvation. This is not made up. This is actually real. This is actually biblical. Okay, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3. Um, you know what? I'm going to show you one verse just... No, no, no. I'll do that the next verses. We'll look at verse 7. Verse 7. But what things were gained to me? So see, all those things from verse 5 through 6, those things that were considered gain to Paul, that he gained, that he earned. He says, those I counted lost for Christ. Paul said, but you know what? I count those things. I deem them as loss. Why? Because in the comparison of Jesus Christ's righteousness. When you compare yourself with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, there is no comparison whatsoever. There is no comparison whatsoever. So because there is no comparison whatsoever based upon the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you know right there that uh, everything should be counted loss. But remember the Old Testament, you didn't have that, remember? Jesus Christ did not die on the cross. He wasn't even born yet to prove His own righteousness. So because he wasn't there to prove his own righteousness for mankind, that's the reason why they had to do the law. They had to do it blamelessly. But now that you have Jesus Christ, no matter what thing you do, it's counted as loss in the face of Jesus Christ. Comparison is poor. It's poor. Let's look at Philippians chapter 3 and then verse 8. Yea, doubtless. So Paul says... Uh, yea, which means basically yes, or yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, yes, doubtless, so without doubt, right? Without doubt. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. So he says he counts all those things that he did according to his works for salvation, they're considered loss. For what? In comparison to the excellency, it's considered excellence. What? The knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. It's considered excellent. This knowledge is considered to be excellent. Christ, why? Because it's based on Christ Jesus, who is my Lord. He is our Lord. Is He your Lord? Is He your Lord? It should be considered as excellent. Now, the thing is, is that if people talk poorly of your knowledge of Bible-believing truth, then just say this, uh, why would you talk poorly of something that's considered to be excellent? 
You know, it's considered to be excellent. Oh, you're without love and uh, Jesus Christ will not do what you do. No, uh, God considers it to be excellent even though you consider it to be poor. They don't consider it to be excellent. That's their problem. They don't prize the knowledge. Without knowledge, you're not going to know what is truth. How can you practice Christian love if you didn't learn about that? You know how you learned about that? You heard information or gained knowledge of it. See? You can't do these practical things without those things first. Let's keep reading. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. So ever since, uh, I'm sure you can all agree with me, once you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, then you suffered, right? For whom, based on Jesus Christ, you started to suffer. What? The loss of all things. You, you lost everything. Amen. You lost everything, man. Man, and some of you, you know, you were into fornication. You made good money on gambling. You went to Hollywood. Some of you had all these backgrounds, but guess what? You count it loss. Yes, sir. Yeah. Count it loss, what? Based on you know too much now. Yes, sir. Because you know too much, you know too much, you can't fornicate like you used to back then. You can't party back with those boys again, Brother Robert. You know, you can't go back there. Jared, you can't get poker again and get millions. You can't do that anymore. You know too much now. Sister, you can't go back to singing or the acting world again. Why? You know too much. See, when you know too much, what? You, you gave it up. You yeah. counted it all but loss. Right. Amen. Yeah. All right. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, I feel sorry for all of you. I'm so sorry for you guys for coming here. You know, you, you're in an unfortunate church. Your life got ruined, you know. I feel so sorry for you. And do count them but dumb. Oh, I guess, you, I, guess I shouldn't feel sorry for you guys now. Looks like you're very happy. I don't know why. And do count them but dung. Paul says that, see, they're considered to be garbage. Amen. Dung. You know what dung is? That means excrement. Now, notice that Paul was crude. You know what's that? That I may win Christ. So, so then I'll explain that win Christ later. But he says, I count them but dung. Now, notice that Paul, he had no shame to talk about grotesque stuff. Oh, you know... Uh, I don't believe that Paul should have mentioned, uh, you know, dung or poop or, you know, I mean, here's the thing right here is that Paul didn't care. So you know why this whole place stinks right here? All this considered to be dung. That's why God considers this whole, uh, Paul considered his whole Jewish system right here in the synagogue to be dung, to be garbage right here. This is all your world. This is your job. This is your family life. This is yours. Uh, security, this is your money, this is your hobby, and this is basically what Paul was concentrating, his life was his religion. And he says it's nothing but a load of, basically, you know what? If you update it in today's language, you know what it would be, and I'm not going to say it, just not to be crude right here. But the thing is, is that notice that Paul said it. And there are these uh, Christians who might say, oh, I don't believe that some of these preachers would say these kind of words. Why did Paul say that? He had no shame at verse 8. Yeah. You didn't know what Jesus said? He said, you're not even fit for the dung hill. That's what he said. Lord Jesus Christ said that. Uh, you know what? This matches with Isaiah 64. Go to Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Isaiah 64. Look at the uh, people who say, what the Greek says, the Greek says, and these people who have clean, polished mouths, tell them, well, did you look at what the original Greek says at Philippians 3a? It's very, very crude. All right? Your English King James Bible uh, did it nicely because it's using that archaic Il Elizabethan English. But if you look at the Greek on that one, you'd be shocked. You wet your pants and you would say, no, the Bible never said that. <laughs> Paul never said that. He was a nice guy. Well, I guess I, so Paul considered all that religious system to be a load of garbage and poop. Look at Isaiah 64 verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Notice that self-righteousness here. See, works of righteousness is considered uh, in the Bible as filthy rags. Now, for some of you who don't know that, look at your original Hebrew in that one, if you want to look at the original Hebrew. It's very, very crude, all right? It's filthy rags, and I'm not going to tell you what kind of rag it is, all right? But it's really filthy and dirty, all right? 
cleaning up something else. But basically, if it's referring to your innards right over here, then you can probably guess. But the point is right here, see, that's what God considers mankind's righteousness. Amen. Man's self-righteousness. So see, that's why it makes sense. Lord, Lord, have we not done many wonderful works? You know what you're looking at? Your own works. That's why God says evil workers right here. You're not looking at the righteousness of Jesus Christ instead. All right, we got to finish this off. So let's look at Philippians again. Let's wrap this up. The last part of verse 8. That I may win Christ. So he counted all of this as dung, as wickedness, as something that should be uh, considered as a... A uh, load of dung, load of poop, and uh, whatever modern word you want to use. I'm not going to say it. That he says, why? So that he can win Christ. Now, your modern Bible versions, they're going to say, like, gain Christ or attain Christ. But no, it's, uh, you're not attaining or gaining Christ. It's not something that you do. Because remember what the Bible mentioned again, that your own righteousness, right? Verse 6, verse 5, that should be considered dung. So it's not something Paul has to work for. See? He won Christ. So why do we sing you're on the winning side? I am on the winning side. Yes, I'm on the winning side. You know why we sing that? Because when we, got, uh, when we cast off our own work and then we receive Christ for our salvation, so we already won. So we win Jesus Christ. But there's something more to it than that. The winning right here is referring to basically the prize at verse 14. See that? It's winning a prize right here. So, you're going to win a prize. Amen. So, uh, I'll explain that part later, but the next part of Philippians, now I'm going to be explaining to you about how this works what Paul is going to talk about. He traded his old Jewish life for something better. And then uh, verses 10 through 14 or 9 through 14 has been greatly uh, twisted where uh, there's a lot of wrong doctrine on that. They teach wrong doctrine on this one. So I'm going to teach you uh, what the meaning of verse 9 through 14 is. Some people take it as that you have to work hard to get a rapture. You have to work hard to really prove your salvation and stuff like that. But 9 through 14, I'm going to explain what the meaning is behind that one. And this matches with everything basically on Christian race. All right, so everything, if you want to preach about the Christian race, 9 through 14 is a must. It is a must, and we will expl I'll explain more about the Christian race and the meaning. We don't really understand the meaning of the Christian race. And I'll explain that in our next Philippians study. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has opened our eyes more of the Scripture, made us appreciative of salvation in Christ Jesus, and to help us to rejoice constantly, and to not look at the doom and gloom of the world, and to count everything in this world but dung for the name of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, and help us to prize right doctrine, Bible-believing truth so importantly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.